This is Bible Academy. Today we continue in the book of Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 12. Now before we get started, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this privilege and opportunity and all the things you provided so that we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin by looking at the translation that we studied through last time, beginning in 13.1. A wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. From the fruit of his mouth a man eats what is good, but the desire of the treacherous is for violence. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to terror. The appetite of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the life of the diligent is fattened. A righteous man hates anything false, but the wicked becomes a stench and causes himself to be ashamed. Righteousness guards the blameless way, but wickedness overthrows the sinner. There is one who pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. And there is one who pretends to be poor and has great riches. The ransom of a person's life is his wealth, but the poor person hears no threat. The light of the righteous shines brightly, but the lamp of the wicked is put out. There is strife only with pride, but with those who take counsel there is wisdom. Wealth gained from vanity will dwindle, but he who gathers by hand increases. Well, we'll continue with verse 12 where we see a new section coming in called the satisfaction with wisdom versus frustration through foolishness. Verse 12 gives us some of the psychological effects of the kind of people that those who gain their wealth from and vanity. Verse 12. Hope deferred causes the heart to become sick, but like a tree of life, it is a desire fulfilled. When we think of hope, we think of something that's good in the future, some sort of expectation, that's the idea here, a change for the better. Here the word deferred is used a little different. It's used in a continuous deferment sense. In other words, permanent deferred, permanently deferred, permanently put off. It'll never happen. It's like the team who never wins a game and they say, wait till next year. They don't win. Wait the next year. They never win. But this is more serious. Hope deferred causes the heart to become sick. The idea is grief, depression, a loss of morale. It moves into despair, perhaps even to death. This is those who build up a security that thinks that that security will last them perhaps a retirement till death. But it never happens. They never get that security. It leads to worry, depression, heartache. In contrast, but like a tree of life, a desire fulfilled. This is the righteous, wise person, the, the righteous, wise person who experiences that tree of life, the satisfied life, that is, the good life, living before God in integrity. The one who experiences that tree of life in this life and the one in eternity, you've learned to live by faith while depending on God. Rather than ending life in a heartache, whether in this life or in the future, Rather, life is fulfilled, a life of peace and prosperity that carries right on into eternity. 
The tree of life represents the greatest satisfaction and fulfillment one can have in the present life. But then again, it moves into eternity. Verse 13 brings in the importance of what one relies upon to have that tree of life, to partake of that tree of life, to eat of it. Verse 13, whoever despises the word will pay for it, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. Whoever despises the word, the word for despise here, let me just show it to you for a moment, it's short. Boos, to scorn, to hold in contempt. Whoever scorns the word, the word here is in its broader use, it's the word of God, particularly the wisdom here. Instructions, teachings, commandments, that'll come out in the next line. This is God's word. To despise the word stems from pride thinking that one does not need God's word or direction in their life. They're under the delusion that one can live a good life without God. You know, there's a simple principle that comes out of Proverbs 16.20. When we trust the word of God, we're trusting God. Remember that. When you trust the word of God, you believe the word, you obey the word, you're living by faith and obeying God. So the penalty, whoever despises the word will pay for it. He's in debt to it. So here the metaphor extends into the future, where one is pictured as owing a debt, which will be paid at the judgment. Justice will come to the wicked when his debt comes to. Now the contrast. But he who fears a commandment will be rewarded. The word for fear here means to revere, to be in awe. By here it here it's means obedience. A commandment, the word, the wisdom. But he who fears a commandment will be rewarded. This is the reward that comes to those who obey God's law under the old covenant. Who follow wisdom, God's order who understands that the word of God is just that. It is the inspired word, words given to live by. Verse 14 brings us the near and far penalties of accepting or rejecting the word of God. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. The fountain of life has the idea of life giving it gives you a better life let's make an observation here for a moment we don't see this one too often but this is called a synthetic proverb it's not antithetical where the two lines are opposites it's not synonymous where they basically say the same thing in a little different way it's synthetic the second line complements or builds on the previous one Here we see that the teaching of the word and wisdom is life-giving. It's a process. But at the same time, it saves from a sure death, the snares of death. In other words, you're going to get the benefits of life on earth if you partake of the fountain of life and at the same time, well, protect you from falling in those traps that lead to the miserable life of the unfaithful. So that wisdom teaching helps turn you away from the snares of death. You'll be alert to them. You'll be aware of them. You'll avoid them. Those traps that seek to pull us away from God. It can come in a person, come in a situation, or consequences. There are many traps out there in this world, in the Cosmos Diabolicus. Many of them have very destructive methods. They're used by wicked men and women, organizations, uh, the false churches, that is, those who are full of heresy and false teaching. 
They're the ones that grab hold of the fool, that make a person religious. Many traps out there. But if you're wise, if you're partaking of the fountain of life, you're growing in the good life according to God's way, you'll avoid those traps. Verse 15 gives us another result of drinking from this fountain of life, or not. Good judgment wins favor, but the way of the treacherous leads to their destruction. Good judgment here is good sense, understanding. That is built up from drawing from that fountain of life daily, from the word of God, growing in the good life. This wins favor. The word means it's pleasing. It's attractive. Here the favor is to both God and community. We see this in the lives of many in the scripture. Let me give you some examples. Joseph, Genesis chapters 39 through 41. Samuel, 1 Samuel 2.26. David, 1 Samuel 18, 14 through 16. Daniel, Daniel 1, 9, 19 and 20. And of course, our Lord Jesus, Luke 2, 52. Those with some wise discernment will see the good decisions that those with good judgment make. And they favor them. They say, that's a good person. Or they might come up to you if you're a parent and say, you did a good job, mom or dad, in raising your kid. The principle carries over into the New Testament as well, Romans 14, 18. For he who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. So the favor here is by God and by man. In contrast, verse 15 again, but the way of the treacherous leads to their destruction. The treacherous here is those who are faithless, the one who betrays, the deceiver, the disloyal, leads to their destruction. Notice the way. Their way is a dead end, literally. No favor with God or man to fill in from the previous line. It's a way of misery, of loss, and of course, that leads right into eternity, where the greatest loss will occur, a separation from God forever. In verse 16, we have a contrast between the shrewd person and the fool. Every shrewd man acts with knowledge, but a fool flaunts his folly. The shrewd person here is one who anticipates the outcomes of his decisions. We sometimes call him prudent. He outsmarts his opponent. He's one step ahead of them. A wise Christian will be shrewd, especially around his enemies, his opponents. The word acts here, let me talk about that word for a moment. That may have another meaning. There's some discussion among scholars exactly what this means. It may mean to cover. and. Uh, in the sense of just to cover something, to hide something. And that fits well in the uh, opposite uh, concept we have here, the opposite of flaunting. So the idea is a shrewd person may not reveal his intentions or his thoughts. Uh, we use an expression in card playing, don't show your hand. It can mean here to take refuge or cover because you know something beforehand, aware of a danger. At any rate, it isn't acting with knowledge or taking cover. Either way, it includes to avoid, to avoid the fool who flaunts his ways. Now, you know what flaunting means. You're just going to show it to everybody. Um, the word in ancient language means to spread out like a garment or a fishing net, to set it out in the open, you see. This person shows his hand. He lets people know what his thinking is and even flaunts it. Perhaps a braggart, this is what I'm going to do. He flaunts what he's going to do because he does not perceive the consequences or that anyone can stop him or outwit him. 
So the shrewd and the fool act in opposite ways to what they do with what they know. Verse 17 addresses the contrast between our two types and they're taking messages to others. Interesting lesson here about taking messages. How does it work in the practical world if you have a wicked person versus someone who is faithful? Let's give you a little background here after I read it. A wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful envoy brings healing. Communication in the ancient world was by um, someone transporting that message by some kind of courier. You wrote a note, you wrote a letter or a tablet, you passed it on to a messenger, and he would take it to the person you wanted to go to. We see that many times in the New Testament when the apostles would have a letter sent or they would receive a letter. It's taken by someone who's assigned to take it there. Now you would not want a wicked messenger. That would be a person who's unreliable. They fall into trouble. That is, they fall into wicked ways. They, they never end up delivering the message. Or it's delayed so long that it doesn't have any worth when it gets there. The point is that wicked people are unreliable as messengers. But a faithful envoy brings healing. Now, envoy in those days was a messenger or representative in government service. A courier, they called him, that we would call him today. It was a, he was a mainstay for centuries in the ancient world. They played an important role in delivering messages for the king or other officials, perhaps in a military situation when someone would be sent to give the commander his orders from the king. In those days, an envoy, messenger, let's call him, he had other skills as well. If he worked for the king, he'd be trained in writing and languages. He could fulfill the role as a diplomat or soldier or royal agent. Now the faithful, the loyal envoy minds his duties well. He's very dutiful. It says here he brings healing. There are many ways he could do that. He could bring healing to a community, a people, a nation, maybe an army. He may deliver a truce, an important agreement between two conflicting parties. So it was important that he was to be trusted. The success of his mission depended on his trustworthiness. So we're going to want faithful envoys and messengers, or we want to be faithful envoys and messengers. In verse 18, we see another proverb regarding reward for our two types. Verse 18, poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is honored. Poverty and disgrace here is a hendiatus here, meaning the two words are basically trying to say the same thing, describing each other, you might say. So it comes out to something like shameful poverty. Shameful poverty come to him who ignores instruction. This is a person who is poor because of his or own bad choices. His or her own bad choices. We've seen this in many of our proverbs where a person is just lazy. We've seen terms like sluggards or slothful. Descriptions like they like to sleep in rather than work. Their reward is going to be poverty and disgrace. Now let's understand in the ancient world there were also those who were poor with integrity. I call them legitimate poor. You've seen me teach about the poor before. The illegitimate would be those who 
well, they're described as lazy and sluggards. They don't want to work. They want to live off others. They want to live off handouts. That's the ones who end up in poverty and disgrace. But there are those with integrity. In other words, they were legitimate poor in the ancient world. Proverbs 17, 1, 19, 1. It's important to understand this because later on we have another proverb on it. They may be wronged. They may be good, hard-working people, and they've been wronged. There was some injustice, 1323. We're coming up to that. Now, this passage is talking about the illegitimate poor, the shameful poor, who ignore instruction, and it seriously costs them. Rejecting sound principles from God's word can cost a person all that he has and bring disgrace upon him. Bad decisions that ignore wisdom brings the worst life. In contrast, those who heed, that means listen and obey reproof or correction, they are honored in society and from God. If you want reward in this life, you need to be willing to take correction. And generally speaking, in a good and decent society, it will honor you. That's a big if sometime. We'll talk about that later. Verse 19 with the righteous desires can be fulfilled. With the righteous desires can be fulfilled. Verse 19. Desire fulfilled is sweet to the person, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. Here we have another inexact opposite. One line is mental, the other is ethical. We can do some fill in in a moment. A desire is a godly legitimate desire. One from a righteous, wise person. It is sweet to the person. The word there is nephish again, we've seen so often. But an abomination to fools is to depart from evil. Now, this is kind of a twisted way to look at it, but when they depart from evil, it's an abomination to a fool. In other words, that's something they would never do. They love their evil. This is where they thrive in their godlessness and immorality. Going back to the previous Proverbs, the fool, unrighteous, unfaithful, can never experience the tree of life or drink from the fountain of life and have that good, satisfied life where those desires are met. Since he rejects the ways of God, he gains nothing good and lasting. Only the righteous the wise experience the sweet satisfaction of a good, wholesome life. The wicked fool often goes back to the same old stuff, the same old sin, the same old lifestyle. They live in a fool's paradise. He will never experience the kind of life that God has for those who become his. Verses 20 and 25, the blessed future of the wise versus the miserable end of the fool. Walk with the wise and become wise, but whoever associates with fools will suffer harm. To walk with the wise is to have them as a companion, to be in fellowship with them. Picture yourself walking along with them, learning and sharing and perhaps watch, uh, following their example, learning from them. Then we have the contrast. But whoever associates with fools, that has the idea of, well, adopting their wicked lifestyle. They will suffer harm. The idea here is that they bring harm on themselves. You don't want to associate with that. That doesn't make any sense. Fools associate with fools. You see? Verse 21 
gives us the present and future reward for our two types again in contrast Twenty-one. Trouble pursues sinners, but good things reward the righteous. Here we have another inexact opposite proverb. Here, both trouble and good things are person personified. They are portrayed as people. So, trouble is like a person, and good things is like a person. Here, trouble pursues. The word means to persecute, to chase, and even hunt. Trouble pursues sinners. The sinner is one who doesn't follow God's law. He's outside the law. He doesn't use wisdom. His life is centered on self to satisfy his cravings, his lusts, just to keep his life, his way of life going. He's pictured as hunting a sinner. Well, trouble is pictured as hunting a sinner. You follow through on the analogy, seeking him to destroy him, to capture him. In contrast, good things reward the righteous. Good things are brought to them. You follow God's law. You live by wisdom. You're rewarded. In God's order of things, which we assume is a decent moral society, and they are rare, but when it's done right, there's reward for those who work within the system of decency and morality. Wisdom gives you the best way to benefit in this type of society. And that's a big assumption nowadays because often immorality is accepted as morality. Wrong is right and right is wrong. We know that as Christians. We know that as believers in our country here in the United States where this is coming from. If society was moral and just, it would not penalize believers for saying what they think and doing the right thing. But when society is right, and that's the assumption in these proverbs, then society rewards the moral and decent. Minimal trouble from the correct system, from the righteous system, we might say. In fact, the righteous are often rewarded for doing the things right, living properly. They thrive within God's order. Verse 22 gives us another result of the contrasting lives. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of a sinner is stored up for the righteous person. Now, this is an interesting twist on things. A good man here is the righteous wise. He passes on an inheritance to his children. The prosperity he's accumulated passes on to his children and his grandchildren. And many would say, well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing on your on your last years of life to think about you've got something good to pass on to your children. But notice he's accumulated something that's amounted to uh, some sort of wealth. Wealth comes in many ways. But the wealth of a sinner, notice the contrast. Whatever he's accumulated is worth anything. We can think in terms of material here. It doesn't go to his children, but to the righteous. They say, now how does that happen? It happen in a number of ways. He has to pay off a debt. There goes his wealth. Maybe he's had to, he's, he's been uh, convicted of a crime and now he has to pay his fine. The crooked businessman who goes broke and sells his assets to those who do business right. Or the tax man cometh and finds that he's a cheat and he loses out in a big way. Maybe the uh, sinner is a leader of a country or an army and he loses everything. 
and what he had becomes plunder for the just. And this happens in history. We have many records of it happening. Think of how the Egyptians lost much of their wealth to the exiting Jews. Or the Canaanites losing their land to Joshua and his armies, leading the people of Israel. In the future, the righteous will inherit the earth once dominated by the cosmos diabolicus, by wicked people, by sinners. So ultimately, when final justice comes, the wealth of the sinner goes to the righteous person. If we follow God's ways, the wise ways, it can pass from generation to generation. But to live in sin results in leaving for your children nothing but trouble. They inherit your sinful ways, your crooked ways. That's for the sinner. Now let's reflect for a moment on this. Taking from what we've learned from the Proverbs, the best thing any parent can leave their child is a heart full of biblical truth. Of course, it's always up to the child whether they're going to accept it or not, to believe it, obey it. But that's the best thing any parent can do to try to instill into their children a love for the truth. There is no better legacy than to pass on a love for the Lord and growth to spiritual maturity. Verses 23 and 24 give us some of these principles that work out in the family. This is interesting. The unplowed field of poor people yields plenty of food, but it is swept away through injustice. Now this takes some background again. Let's look at the Mosaic Law for a moment. The Mosaic Law states, for six years you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops. But during the seventh year, let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it, and the wild animals may eat what is left. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Your olive grove. Now, this is hard for us to understand in our modern society because this is not Israel today. So understand, as we've seen with all the Proverbs, their assumption is they're under the Old Covenant. And here's a good example where it's clearly under the Old Covenant. If things were done right, the poor would have plenty to eat. Now this is the legitimate poor, which we talked about earlier. If the owners and managers of the field followed the law, the poor would eat. They wouldn't starve. However, notice but they would not eat. It swept away. In fact, the term means and includes they could be swept away through injustice. If those owners or managers, the field supervisor, were acting unjustly, skimming off the top, not leaving the food, what they should by law, then the poor would not get what was rightfully theirs. Do you understand that? That's so different than we think today. They were supposed to leave food for the poor. Poor were part of society. God provided for the poor through providing extra for those who are not poor. These legitimate poor are deprived here of food when their rulers did not follow the law. But when they did, that is, I say their rulers, I mean their those who owned the fields, the managers of the fields, when they followed the law, the legitimate poor ate. It's not a problem with the system. The system worked perfectly. It's the injustice that people put into that system and mess things up. 
So the poor don't eat as they should. Perhaps they run the people off the land, don't provide them what they're supposed to, and those poor people have to move on or starve. It's also a way to wipe them out. God provides for the hardworking poor in this world if people follow the system. God's law provided for the legitimate poor. So if they starved, it wasn't because of the law. It was because of injustice. It's because of sinners who selfishly take advantage of the poor. Jesus taught that there will always be poor on this earth, Matthew 26, 11, until he returns. There's always going to be tyrants who will also take advantage of the poor, withhold what is rightfully theirs. Well, there will either be retribution or reward depending on how one acts according to God's law. Verse 24 addresses a key parent's responsibility regarding their children, one of the probably better known proverbs. The one who holds back his rod is one who hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Probably not the most familiar translation you've seen, but it's pretty accurate according to the Hebrew. Let's talk about the word rod for a moment. The rod was the Shebet. Let me show you the word. Shebet could be a rod, a staff, a club, or a scepter. It's used for discipline or punishment, literally or figuratively, like God would use the rod against Israel, Isaiah 10.24. In our passage, however, it's literal. This is parents, a father or mother, using a rod, a stick, or something similar used to discipline a child by corporal punishment, by bodily causing pain, physical pain upon the child, by striking him on the backside. And note, let me go back to our verse, note the possessive pronoun, his rod. Parents has a rod that they're going to discipline their child with. In contrast, but he, that is the parent, who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Diligent means to be consistent and fair and measured and timely. All that's part of proper discipline. Don't miss that. Consistent, fair, measured, and timely. Let's read it again. The one who holds back his rod is one who hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. To hate is to neglect, to not care. To withhold discipline from a child is to neglect and not care to not show love for the son. On the other hand, to love him diligently is to discipline him. If you love your child, you're very diligent towards your discipline, not to be done out of anger, Ephesians 6, 4, from a whim, because you just want to hit someone, you're mad, that's abuse, obviously. God himself is our model for this. We've seen that in the early Proverbs 3.12. Because whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. We see this even today in God's love for us. Revelation 3.19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. If you're into sin, repent, or you're going to get disciplined. Loving parents discipline their children. This doesn't mean you always have to use corporal punishment, uh, bodily physical punishment with a switch or a paddle. But you use what is effective that will teach him or her a lesson. To not love your children is to refuse to give them the needed punishment in the right way. 
and it's sure to set them on the wrong course, perhaps for life. This is described as hating one's child. A lot is at stake regarding disciplining a child. If a parent does not discipline a child and do it properly, that child is more likely to fall in the way of sinners as he gets older, or maybe even as younger. Without proper and timely correction, a child has not learned from his mistakes and sin that it will cost him or her. To not do so teaches them they can get away with misbehavior. The sin nature needs to be tamed while the child is still at home. While the child is still under your authority, you instill in that person the correct value to adopt and live by it. Otherwise, there's a penalty. He needs to learn or she needs to learn that there's a, if there's a lack of punishment or even reward, that can be for good behavior. So they learn there's a lack of punishment or even some reward when they do the right thing. And punishment would mean loss for bad behavior. Another thing. Parents who discipline their children properly give them a real advantage in life. It may not come out so much in their youth, but as they get older, they will realize that they think differently. They have some self-discipline. They're not running around doing things that so many are doing. They will have different values than many in society, and that good and decent society often acknowledges good behavior and rewards it. If you love your child, you will discipline your child. Folly in the heart of a child and using just words will not always dislodge that folly. Sometimes it takes more. And parents, you discipline your child as someone you greatly value. You don't want to damage the child by being too harsh or unfair, but you always discipline with love to make them better. Parents who don't discipline their children may hate the way that child turns out. It gives them a lifetime of trouble. That child gives them a lifetime of trouble. Well, we close the chapter with that other, big, that other bookend of the inclusio, if you recall, this time the word appetite, again, the word nephish. Remember the earlier word was eat back in verse 2, so in between verses 2 and 25, we have this overall theme of eating and satisfaction of the appetite or not, living the good life or not, drawing from the fountain of life, experiencing the tree of life, while here in this life and then into the future. Verse 25, our closing verse. A righteous person has enough food to satisfy his appetite, but the belly of the wicked lacks bread. This kind of sums up the whole chapter well. The righteous person, the righteous wise, has enough food to satisfy his appetite. Now this goes beyond the simple physical satisfaction of food, from the verses we've seen, this is the righteous person who has his satisfied appetite, and that extends to one's spiritual, psychological, and physical well-being. He lives out the satisfied life where he lives in obedience under the old covenant in those days, under God's system of wisdom, but it's the wonderful temporal life that continues on right into eternity. In contrast are those who lack bread, those who suffer through this life, suffer in their spiritual, psychological, and physical well-being as well. Just the opposite. This is all, again, Old Covenant based living according to the law brought blessing 
not living according to the law brought cursing. Leviticus 26. Well, let's close by looking at our translation. This time we'll get it in, beginning in verse 12. Verse 12, hope deferred causes the heart to become sick, but like a tree of life is a desire fulfilled. Whoever despises the word will pay for it, but he who fears the commandment will be rewarded. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. Good judgment wins favor, but the way of the treacherous leads to their destruction. Every shrewd man acts with knowledge, but a fool flaunts his folly. A wicked messenger falls into trouble, but a faithful envoy brings healing. Poverty and disgrace come to him who ignores instruction, but whoever heeds reproof is honored. A desire fulfilled is sweet to the person, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. Walk with the wise and become wise, but whoever associates with fools will suffer harm. Trouble pursues sinners, but good things reward the righteous. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of a sinner is stored up for the righteous person. The unplowed field of poor people yields plenty of food, but it is swept away through injustice. The one who holds back his rod is one who hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. A righteous person has enough food to satisfy his appetite, but the belly of the wicked lacks bread. Let's pray. Well, Father, we do thank you again for these words of wisdom. Challenge us with them. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.